Hello, I'm Simon Benjamin and this is Lecture 8, the very last one, in my course on Fourier series, Fourier transforms and partial differential equations. Being the last one, I'm wearing a waistcoat. I thought I'd make a bit of an effort. And uh, I think you'll find that this is a, I hope, a pretty interesting lecture. The maths level is gone back to a much more modest one after we really went uh, deep in the last lecture and, uh, and, and had to sort of really reach for some sophisticated solutions. This, I think, will be a, a gentler presentation. Um, so let's have a look. I want to wrap up the whole diffusion topic uh, by showing um, or looking at uh, an overview of all the different things we've done and summarizing them. Then it is on to some fresh material deriving the wave equation, which is perhaps the most important equation in physics. There's something called D'Alembert's formula, again, excuse my accent, uh, which is a very important insight that comes immediately after we've derived the wave equation. And then we'll get down to solving a particular scenario, an extremely interesting one that captures a lot of the ideas of waves, which is a vibrating string. And, that, and then we'll be able to see if we can actually um, use our ideas to predict successfully how uh, something like a vibrating string behaves in the real world. So a guitar string, for example. As always, the notes uh, for this course are available at simonb.info and elsewhere. So what I have here is a table uh, that I've pasted in from my notes, the brand new version of my notes that I just uploaded, by the way, in case you have an older version. Um, and uh, I've scribbled onto uh, these uh, printed, these uh, typeset notes, some little diagrams to remind us of all the different things we've done. So let me just very quickly run through it. We uh, have thought about what happens if you either have um, matter diffusion, which of course is fixed second law, or heat diffusion with from the heat diffusion equation, where you start off with a distribution that can be described by some kind of periodic function, such as the um, infinite square wave. It doesn't have to be a square wave. You would use the same techniques for any kind of periodic distribution. The square wave is a good one. It could be a series of um, thin layers, films, um, forming a stack, which then uh, blend into each other if it were matter diffusion. And the technique that we use there is that we used a Fourier series to build the initial condition, and then we inserted a term e to the minus uh, k squared t, also with a diffusion or um, uh, a, either matter or temperature diffusion coefficient up in there, unless it's equal to 1. And the result is that the higher um, order terms in the Fourier series decay the most rapidly, and so we end up smoothing off our initial distribution and then over time it becomes more and more smooth until eventually it reaches um, just a flat distribution. Then the second thing we looked at uh, was, or the second thing I want to summarize, uh, was what happens if we have a uh, scenario where there's um, only a finite width to our problem, like a length of a bar or the width of a sheet of material, and the endpoints are held at two different temperatures or concentrations. So there, what the, we needed to do was make our function periodic, and we had to do that carefully uh, because we had to think about how to extend a finite function into a periodic form so that we don't introduce any discontinuities or other anomalies. And we've talked about that a fair bit. And what we found is that if we'd done it properly, um, the long-term solution would just be a, a straight line between the two fixed points, and on um, intermediate timescales we would just get um, again, a softening and a reduction in the initial distribution. Pretty much intuitive stuff. Then we, uh, I, well, then I would like to talk about the, actually the thing we did first, which was what if we have a Gaussian distribution in the first place? For example, we've heated up a region of a bar with a blowtorch, and it can be described reasonably with uh, a Gaussian. And again, there's a symmetry argument here that meant that mathematically that's the same as if we had a heat distribution at one end of an infinite bar. It would be the same mathematical um, treatment. So in that case, uh, we ended up with another Gaussian, as we had guessed we should. But the interesting point is that the thing spread out in time with a speed, if you like. The characteristic width increased according to the square root of time. So the more it uh, evened out, the more slowly it continued to spread. And that, in fact, is the um, what we what we saw again and again in all these solutions is that there would tend to be a root t uh, behavior. Okay, then we thought about uh, winding back the Gaussian solution in time until all the energy was focused in one point or all the material was just focused in one uh, infinitely thin layer. And we realized that that was just 
going to give us a Gaussian again, but this time we were able to formally show it, and there we used the Fourier transform method uh, rather than the Fourier series. But we used our same trick, which was to simply put in this decaying time factor, um, but now we put it into the integral, just like we put it into the sum previously. And uh, uh, that allowed us to, in fact, rederive the Gaussian solution. And then the final and most uh, impressive thing that we did really quite tough was to consider the innocent sounding situation of two uh, blocks of material that were next to each other or at different temperatures and next to each other or one block that was in contact with a reservoir. Again, mathematically, we can show that these uh, receive the same treatment. And a physical example would be the carburization of steel, where carbon uh, penetrates into the surface of steel until we've got just the concentration that we want. And that was another Fourier transform scenario. Uh, this time Fourier transform of a step function, same trick to put in that time dependent exponential decay. It's simply that now the mathematical treatment was more challenging. We ended up with an error function. And again, we saw that the uh, shape of the error function or how rapidly it softened was characterized by the square root of t. So a lot of stuff that we've looked at there, a lot of analysis. And I think it's fair to say that we've comprehensively looked at the diffusion equation in many different forms. We've usually made it 1D, but very often the three-dimensional extension to this is, is very, very straightforward because the dimensions just separate and you get a one-dimensional problem in each direction, so to speak. Moving on. Okay, so now I would like to talk about waves. What we'll do first is derive the governing differential equation that tells us how a wave behaves. And to do that, we'll think of the case that we have a, an elastic string um, that's fixed at two points along the x-axis, and we want to know how it vibrates. The equation that we get, however, will be much more general than that and will apply to electromagnetic waves and waves on oceans and all sorts of things. But this is how we will get to it. So let me draw um, a sketch of what I want to think about. All right, let me pause in my drawing now and uh, talk about what I've drawn so far. By the way, the analysis we're going to do here is very reminiscent of how we got the diffusion equation in terms of taking small pieces and thinking what's happening at the boundaries of a small piece. So here in the purple line, I've drawn, um, so this, this path here is actually our string. So it's a hugely exaggerated sort of oscillation that looks like a string that's, uh, it could, could be the case, I guess. And I've just drawn an arbitrary curve. You could draw any curve you like, except that it has to be fixed at x equals zero, the, uh, the, our string is fixed to the x-axis and at x equals l, it's the same thing. So the uh, y direction in our diagram is the displacement. So this could literally be a photograph uh, with a sort of fast, fast um, acting camera that just uh, is able to take a crisp shot of a rapidly moving thing of a vibrating string. Now, what we're focusing on is a little bit of string, just like in the diffusion equation, we fo focused on a little bit of a little slice of the region so that material was diffusing in and out. Now we want a little piece of string. And uh, of course, we're going to think of it as being infinitesimal, really. But to draw it, we have to give it some finite sort of, um, oops, some finite width to it. So I've tr I'll so sort of bolding it in here. That's the piece we're interested in. These two extra lines I've drawn on here are supposed to be tangents to the curve at point A and point, let's call this point A. Uh, maybe I'll draw below. Yeah, maybe. Um, so that's, we'll call that point A and this is point B. So these are tangents to that curve that are point, point A and point B. So let me carry on now and just write on a few more elements. Right, so I've added in there a few more features. I've put on a couple of forces. Force one that acts at point A and force two that acts at uh, point B. And these forces are pulling in different directions. They are the forces which are acting on our little segment of our elastic string. So remember, it's an elastic string, so it has a tension. And that little piece of string that I've identified by uh, drawing it in bold there, let me circle it, this little piece of string here clearly has uh, forces on it. We're just interested in the forces on it due to the fact that it is elastic. So the string is stretched and it's trying to pull itself back um, to a, a shorter length. And so we can see that this little piece of string is going to have a force that's pulling it to the left and a force that's pulling it to the right. But they're not going to be um, in the horizontal direction. Those forces are going to be along the tangent of the string at those two points. So we have F1 and we have F2. And crucially, those forces are not quite in uh, opposite directions. And so we need to care about that slight difference. These forces are, by the way, not small. 
because they are the, the magnitude of them it relates to the the tension in the string which isn't necessarily a small quantity but um, the things like the difference in their angle will be small so that's the kind of thing we now need to explore i've also drawn on here alpha and beta and these are the angles that those two forces make with the horizontal so i hope it's pretty clear from the diagram what all those ingredients are now we can begin our analysis now we're going to start by making an assumption which if we were worried about it we could actually watch some strings vibrating uh, with a sort of high speed video camera and we could verify that this is true um, unless you go out of your way to, to, to sort of set up an initial condition that would break it uh, in general a vibrating string will have the property that a particular point let me mark one uh, away from where all the other clutter on my diagram is will just vibrate up and down in the center so what I mean by that is it won't vibrate from side to side so that point that I've marked in red will not uh, go either left or right it will just go up and down so there will be no uh, lateral movement of uh, elements on my string with that assumption I can now uh, go ahead and start balancing out some forces so if our little piece of string is not moving left or right and it's not even going to start moving left or right what that means is that the forces um, must balance each other in terms of the component that is in the horizontal direction so we can immediately write down a constraint on the horizontal component of those forces so I'm actually switching to using the symbol T just to remind myself that uh, in the context of an elastic string we can talk about the tension uh, within the string itself so the tension at point 1 uh, has a magnitude t1 and the tension at point 2 is a magnitude t2 but crucially we want to equate the horizontal components of that and so that should be cos and we can confirm its cos by realizing that if the angles went to zero then all the tension would be in these two directions okay so that's really helpful now we need to think about resolving in the vertical direction Ooh, I've just added in there that uh, what we can think of is that since these two quantities must be equal to each other let's just give them the symbol t and uh, that will help us in simplifying okay what's this uh, second equation I've got here well here we have the difference between um, the forces that act vertically um, on the two ends of the string so what we're now thinking about is will the string uh, be in cap will the forces on the string the net forces make it want to accelerate um, in the up direction in other words speed up or accelerate in the downward direction and uh, or sort of uh, come back towards the uh, relaxed um, horizontal axis so we can find that out just by looking at the diagram and seeing that f1 wants the uh, string to uh, the our little piece of string to go down so it uh, supports an acceleration in the down direction and f2 uh, supports an acceleration in the up direction so we can just take the difference of these two and uh, whichever one wins that will dictate whether the acceleration is um, positive or negative now so that is simply the uh, force that's um, on and uh, the net force in the vertical direction and then on the other side of our equation here what do we have nothing else but uh, mass times acceleration so we, we know from Newton that force equals mass times acceleration our mass is the density per unit length that's what I'm using the row symbol for here um, multiplied by the uh, length of our little component which must be delta x um, from the diagram and then acceleration is of course just the uh, second derivative of the position with respect to time and so there we can write that down immediately so uh, that's captured the question of how forces are acting to cause our little component of uh, our string to move now before I go any further I want to um, combine uh, these lines above into a form that will be more useful for us I want to eliminate these quantities t1 and t2 so that I've only got some kind of uh, constant tension which we've been calling uh, just the simple symbol t and uh, our angles and then all we have left to deal with is the angles so how will I do that well I'll just substitute for t1 and t2 like this we can see that t2 must be uh, t the overall tension divided by cos beta and T1 is the overall tension divided by cos alpha just from the previous equation so now we won't need the diagram for a bit we can simplify there we are um, and uh, that is going to be helpful because we can immediately see that these quantities are tan so let me write that in how can we get any further well we have to think what uh, tan actually means so now we will go back to the diagram 
what does the tan of uh, an angle anywhere on this curve mean? In fact, because it's so cluttered up in the focus area of our little piece of string, I could draw um, a line at some other point. It's the same answer anywhere. So have a think about this. Here I've uh, tried to uh, suggest the tangent to my curve at this orange point. Um, what does the tan of that angle there, which we could call I don't know, gamma or something. We won't be using it, of course, because it's not part of the region that we're interested in. What does the tan of that mean? Well, the tan uh, in a triangle, the tan is, of course, the ratio of the two sides, right? So if this side was x and this side was y, um, then, and we had a little angle, which we'll keep on calling uh, gamma in there, then tan of gamma is the uh, ratio at x over excuse me, the, yeah, there we are. <laughs> so um, what does that mean uh, when we go to our curve? Well, we realize that it the tan of the angle is simply the gradient. It's how fast is y changing with respect to x at that point. It, we, we could, uh, if we put little delta symbols here, then we can see immediately what we mean. As we zoom into the curve and we consider a little bit of a y, a little bit of x, we must obtain the tan. So we can immediately uh, substitute where we have our tan alpha and tan beta for the gradients of the curve at those points. Let's do it. Oops, I see that I'd written tan beta twice. Apologies for that. I don't know how I did that. So that should, of course, have been tan beta minus tan alpha. So let's put those gradients in. Well, we're getting there. Uh, what I've emphasized in this way of writing things is I want the gradient dy by dx at the point uh, which is the the right hand end of our piece of string, of course. That's the beta point, or that's point B, where the angle is beta. And then I'm subtracting off the alpha point, which is back at where x is equal to x. So um, that's what I'm putting in brackets here, just to emphasize that we're dealing with two slightly different gradients. And then all we have to do is think, how can we write that difference in a more elegant way. We know that the, the, although the gradient might be quite strong, the difference in the gradient will be very small because we're only considering a, a tiny piece of string and so there can only possibly be a small change in the gradient between those two points. The trick is, and this is the same as we used uh, in the diffusion problem, uh, what we'll do is we'll say, well, the uh, that first element, in fact, let's just um, focus on this first one, if I want to write that in a different way, I could say, well, that must be the gradient um, just at x plus a, a little bit of a change, which would be the rate at which the gradient is changing with x. Let's write it out explicitly. Uh, times that little shift. So it's the second derivative the gradient of the gradient times however far we're going. But then we can see, of course, what the trick is going to be is that uh, the gradient at x now appears twice, and so we'll be cancelling it out, and that gives us a very simple equation. Let me write it out. There I've written now, and I've also taken the opportunity to correct, uh, sneakily correct, uh, another error. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'd written uh, d2y by dx squared over on the right, whereas, of course, that side is by dt squared. Um, so there we are. Uh, this gives us, then, quite a compact form. It would do if I remember to put the dx. There we are. So that equation is what we've reached. Uh, and we can see that we're going to be able to cancel the small, the the, the uh, distance uh, delta x from both sides. And we may as well move all the constants to one side and even give it its, a, a new symbol so that we, so that our final equation has the most elegant possible form. Let's do that. There we are. We're done. Let me put a box around it because it uh, deserves it. Now I've introduced a symbol c squared because I know it's going to be helpful to just define it as uh, the, the constant squared in this way. It's simply that ratio between the tension in the string and the density per unit length of the string. Okay, so of course we want to try this out. We want to build an example, give ourselves a, a reasonable initial condition for a plucked string and watch it go and see if we can solve it. But before that, there's a, an observation we can make straight away from the very structure of this equation. This was the uh, innovation due to de Alembert, um, which, uh, let me check when the year was. Okay, sometime in the 1700s is the answer. Um, and uh, let's see what we get when we simply make a very smart 
choice of change of variables. Something then will come immediately out of these equations that's quite profound. So this is the variable change that I want. It's simply mixing together the space and time parts. And because space and time have different dimensions, we'll certainly need a constant that makes that work. And uh, that constant is c, which, by the way, uh, tells us that c is a speed, right? So c, the dimensions of c, must be a distance over time in order to make these statements dimensionally correct. Um, so with these uh, variables, what happens when we try and transform our equation, instead of being with respect to x and t, uh, make them with respect to these new coordinates? So let's write down the rule that we'll use to change a derivative, say, with respect to x, uh, to instead be derivatives with respect to the new coordinates. So this is the chain rule type structure we come up with. We see that uh, the way that uh, function change changes with respect to x is can be expressed as how fast is it changing with respect to u times how fast is u changing with respect to x plus how fast is it changing with respect to v times how fast v is changing with respect to x. So it, uh, in, this is hopefully a familiar rule for you and it makes a lot of intuitive sense. And now, of course, we can actually write down what some of these things are. So du by dx, um, holding t constant, is just going to be 1. And dv by dx, holding t constant, is also going to be 1. OK, so uh, what we really want, of course, is to take the second derivative. So let's write out what we're after. But now we can just regard the dy by du and dy by dv as just functions. Um, and we, win we made no special assumption about the function y in the first place. So we can just reapply the rule to quickly jump to what we need. So in what I've written here, these first two terms come from just taking the second derivative of the first term there. And similarly, of course, the second two terms come from uh, taking our d by dx derivative of the second of those terms and just following the same principle uh, that we used the first time. But now we can collect things up. So that's just uh, tidying things up slightly. But now we have uh, a nice further uh, observation to make, which is that when you, for a continuous function like y, so we're assuming some things, I said we weren't assuming anything about y, I guess we're assuming uh, that it's not mathematically pathological. It is a function which is capable of describing a string. Um, so it's continuous and you know it, it has this kind of sane behavior that we expect from our function, which means that uh, when we take the derivative with respect to one coordinate and then the other, uh, it doesn't matter which order we do it, that in. And so these two terms that I've highlighted in the middle must be the same. So I can finally write that as, there we are. That's about as neat as it will go. Um, so that is what d2y by dx squared becomes when we put it in our new coordinate system. Now, of course, we have to do the same thing for d2y by dt squared, but uh, we can go quite fast because it's an extremely similar process. Let's just start it off and see how it goes. There we are, exactly the uh, analogous starting expression. And so the, the difference, oops, excuse me. This is, of course, for the first derivative. And... Uh, what we see is that this time we have, of course, du by dt and dv by dt because we're considering the time derivative. But uh, this, what, we, what we'll find then is that we need to put in the constant c for both these things because, of course, uh, we know that u is equal to x plus uh, ct. Oh, and we should have a minus sign. Hang on. And v is equal to x minus ct. So this one is minus c. Uh, fine. So let's uh, just neaten that up a little bit. And now we need to take the second derivative. Let me just do that without wasting much more time. There we are. And as before, you can see that uh, we just apply the, the, the principle we, we found above is just applied a second time to get the second derivatives. And now we can tidy up again. There it is. And we find that we have a c squared constant out in front. And again, I've taken the two terms, which are uh, with uh, these ones, and just combined them. Uh, they are both they're equal to one another, so we just get a factor of two there. Now let's uh, summarize, well, let's insert these two statements. So uh, our original equation, uh, just up to a factor of c squared, that we will certainly find is in the right place, uh, we were saying that we just 
set the d2 by dx squared and the d2 by d time squared equal to one another. Let's do that and see what we're saying in the new coordinates. There we are. So I've just substitu substituted in the equations that we discovered. Uh, and we can see that, yes, the c squareds are in the right place and we can just cancel them out. And it looks like the right-hand side is equal to the left-hand side. Fine, fine, fine. Except then suddenly we notice that this term, the cross derivative, appears with a plus 2 on one side and a minus 2 on the other. All the other terms can just be cancelled. So what this is telling us, just by change of coordinates, is that that, uh, deriv that cross derivative is equal to minus itself. And the only way that that can be true is if it's actually equal to 0. So the discovery is that d2y by du dv is equal to 0. What does that mean? Well, it means that if we were to write our function y in terms of these coordinates, uh, u and v, then taking the der partial derivative with respect to one of these things, holding the other one constant, and then taking the other derivative must give us 0. What does that tell us about the form of the function y uh, when written in these new coordinates? It tells us that the following must be the form. Let me write it down. So uh, what we're saying now is, aha, uh -huh, if we write down our solution to the wave equation as a part that only depends on u and a part that only depends on v and add them up, it's an addition, unlike in separation of variables where we generally have a product, this is simply an addition of two separate terms, then that will satisfy our equation because clearly taking the derivative with respect to v holding u constant will kill the f term and then the other derivative will kill whatever has become of the g term. If these things were a product, if there was even so much as a, let's say, a times u over on this side, then our rule would no longer be followed because um, it would mean that uh, one of these two terms would survive at least in the form of a constant after we have taken both our derivatives. So that imposes this form, which is a pretty, you know, that's a pretty strong conclusion. If we must be able to think of a solution to the wave equation as a solution that involves only one of these coordinates added to a solution in terms of the other, there must be something special about these coordinates. What are we saying? So the way to understand the implications of this is just to consider one of these two functions and then we'll see what it means to have both. So let's just consider the g function actually. So I'm going to say that uh, my um, wave shape, which so back in the coordinates um, space and time, is going to be equal to just one of these two things. So that if I'm going for the v, then that means it must be a function of x minus ct. That's no longer the general case. That's just one of the, that's a special case that only one of these two things that I'm allowed to use, I'm actually going to use. And I'm setting, uh, I'm just choosing to set f is equal to zero for now. What does that mean? So let me draw out a wave or a distribution of y. And we'll assume that this is at some particular moment in time. There we are. I've just drawn a curve. Uh, nothing special about it. And this is at some particular time uh, we'll call it time t is equal to time t1. Now what I'm interested in is what will this line look like at some later time t2. Well let me just draw on what we're going to get at t2 and let me just then I'll justify why. I can get the function at some time t2 just by moving on a bit like uh, what's, let's move on a little bit like that. So what you can see I've done here uh, is just uh, take the, the, the take it and move it a bit, right? So that's just a shifted on version. Um, yeah, maybe I can make that more clear by drawing over it. Hang on. And now if I erase underneath it, there we are. That's kind of nicer. So the pink curve is uh, the T two line. That's at T two. And the green curve was at t1. So what I'm saying is that if my function, uh, my solution for y, uh, can indeed be written as some function of just the difference between x and ct, then um, at later times, the shape of my curve will be 
the same as at any particular moment that I, I care to look at it, it will always keep the same shape, but it will just move along the x-axis. And I wonder if you can see why. So if I um, just consider that, uh, so let's choose a particular point. I think this is the way to do it. Just focus on some point of interest. Let's take that particular point there and we'll call that uh, x1. And then the analogous point later on, if my rule is correct, will be x2. So provided that x2 is equal to x1 plus c times the difference in the two times as a positive thing, so time 2 is uh, later, then we find that if we compute the thing that actually goes into the g function, well, uh, for the green curve, it was x1 minus c t1. And for the pink curve, it's x2 minus, and then, uh, well, sorry, uh, c t2. But that, if I use the substitution above there, is in fact just going to give me x1, and then I'll have plus c t2 minus c t1, uh, minus ct2, running out of space, let me move up a bit, ct2, and of course we've got a cancellation there, let's change color, the cancellation pen, um, we get to cross out that, cross out that, and we find that we're feeding exactly the same number into our function g, and so of course we get the same number back. So maybe uh, stop and stare at that a bit to convince yourself of what I'm saying, but because the function g can only see this hybrid quantity that is x minus ct, then um, if it has, if we can draw the shape of our curve for some particular fixed value of time and, uh, and sweep x, then if we consider a later uh, fixed value of time, we just need to move our entire function along a bit. So what this means is that our function g, which was one of only two parts that we're allowed to use, just the f and the g parts, if we are writing our solution in terms of these new coordinates. Our function g is um, simply describing a wave that keeps its shape, but moves in the positive x direction. And then um, you can uh, guess that if we were to have a careful think about that other function that we're allowed to use, that f object, that would be a wave that keeps its shape but moves at speed c in the negative x direction. And that a general wave, it's already interesting that those things exist, right? That, that a solution to the wave equation uh, or a solution allowed by the wave equation is a thing that keeps its shape and, and propagates in, in the x direction, in either direction. But more than that, what this is telling us is that we should always be able to think of a solution to the wave equation as something uh, that uh, moves in uh, something that moves in the positive x, and some potentially some completely different function could be a different shape, but it moves at the same speed, speed c, in the negative x direction. So that's I think a really nice uh, observation to make just from looking at the fundamental equation itself and doing a coordinate change. And, and this, of course, is exactly what we see, right? So when we throw a rock into a pool, um, then we see ripples, and those ripples move with a fixed speed. Uh, if we throw a bigger rock in, we get bigger ripples, but they will move with, as, to a first approximation, the same speed. Of course, there are higher order, order effects in any particular medium like water, dissipative processes, and so on. But um, to a first approximation in any medium, and in mediums like electromagnetic radiation, it's uh, then strictly the case that... Um, uh, we see w uh, waves propagating, uh, keeping their shape and moving with a fixed speed. And they can move uh, backwards and forwards across the medium, or there can be waves that go one way, waves that go the other way, and they uh, interfere with each other. Uh, so we, the waves add up, but that uh, capturing the idea of something that keeps its shape and just moves is what we immediately discover just from this very elegant argument. Um, so I think that's really nice. But now... But now we're going to uh, think about uh, a scenario where we're fixing a string at two points. And while we could uh, try and express this in terms of waves propagating one way and propagating the other way, that's no longer the natural way to think of it. Um, and so let's see uh, what we find out when we investigate that. 
By the way, briefly going back to our original diagram, if you uh, were being very alert, you might have said, why did it matter that, uh, that I insisted that our string was fixed at x equals 0 and x equals L? Where did that come in? And you'd be right. It actually didn't come in at all. Uh, it was part of our story because it's helpful to then think of a string that has a certain tension because we imagine that it's stretched to some extent even when it lies flat along the x-axis so it's under tension and then when we pluck it it vibrates but we didn't actually use that property and in fact any it could be an infinitely long string if there could be such a thing as long as it had uh, a, a, a certain tension along the string but now we will be using that fact but really for the first time because we haven't used it yet in our analysis so there I've repeated the diagram we had before, but I've cleaned up all the annotation uh, which we don't need now. All we need is the conclusion we reached, which is the wave equation. But now I want to think, uh, how would we set about solving this uh, in the coordinates x and t? Well, as before, uh, when we were looking at the diffusion equation, in general, it's difficult to solve an equation of this form um, for uh, all possible solutions which may mix together the x and the t coordinates in a complex way. But what we can do is we can start to make some progress by saying let's suppose that the way my string is behaving can be uh, described as just a product of um, a function that depends only on uh, the spatial coordinates x and a function that depends only on the time coordinate. So in other words we say let's limit ourselves and it's a huge limitation but we know from experience that we're going to be able to break free of this. But initially we will say, let's imagine that we have some function, let's call it capital X of X, and some function capital T, not temperature, but uh, time uh, of, uh, of time. So if we have a solution of that form, we know that what we can do is uh, then greatly simplify our equation. Because the partial with respect to x doesn't care about the time function and uh, vice versa, and so we can um, immediately turn our um, function, our, our partial derivatives actually become full derivatives. Let me jump to the punchline because we have done this before. What do we get? So we get this function immediately, um, or this equation, uh, and we can we've turned our partial derivatives into total derivatives because the thing they're operating on doesn't even mention the other variable, and then. Our trick is that we divide both sides by the whole solution y, and that leads us to... And then the next line, uh, very similar to what we did before, is to divide throughout by the whole function y, and actually we'll divide by the constant c squared as well. So that will just turn out to be a bit more handy. So what we'll then find is 1 over x, capital X, our function, uh, d2x by d coordinate x squared is equal to 1 over c squared. 1 over t d2 capital T by coordinate t squared. So here I've uh, completely put all the x related quantities on the left, all the time related quantities and the constant by the way on the right and uh, as before we then have the argument that well since this is true for all values of x and t I could for example hold t constant and sweep x but then the left-hand side that depends on x isn't actually allowed to change because I'm holding t, controlling the right-hand side, constant. And so it must be that the left-hand side is in fact always equal to a constant regardless of the value of x. Same argument works the other way around. These two things are both equal to some constant. And now I just get to make up a symbol. I'm going to call it minus k squared. In the notes, I think I use uh, psi and uh, that's just harder for me to write, so I'm going to use k squared. Um, why minus k squared? Because I know that that will work out neater in the next few lines, but I could have used any symbol, and it doesn't have to be squared, and it doesn't have to be minus. But then I'd find myself putting in extra stuff in the next few lines. So what do we get as our separate, our, our separate equations? Two similar, very similar looking expressions. Uh, now remember that when we were doing the diffusion equation, because we only had the first derivative with respect to time, our space and time equations at least were different to each other at this point, but now they're practically identical. The only difference really is that c squared term on the right hand side. And the solutions to these things are both, uh, both of them are solved the same way, which is cos and sine like solutions. So let's write down the general solution for each of these equations.
There we are, that's the general solutions, and I've introduced just temporarily a capital C symbol, just so that I can go A, B, C, D for my unknown constants. Don't worry, we'll get rid of that in a minute, because it is confusing to have two kinds of C around, although I guess I've also got two kinds of X and two kinds of T. Anyway, those are the sine and cos-like solutions that will solve our separated differential equations. What does that mean? It means that a general solution that is separable must have the following form. So there we are, I've just multiplied the line above. Um, so I've multiplied the x and t explicitly, so we can see this is the general form of our solution, where capitals A, B, C, and D convey anything we like. Uh, there's even, you could argue, a bit more freedom than we need there in the, the magnitude of A. Um, uh, you know, we, we could move some of the weighting between A and B and C and D, but uh, that's fine. We'll leave it in that form. That is a separable solution, but our equation is a linear one. The full equation, when we go back to here, this is a linear differential equation, just like it was for diffusion. And that has the very, very powerful consequence that any solution we write down, call it solution one, and any other solution we write down, solution two, can always be added together to make a new legitimate solution. And we can keep on doing this. If we thought of many different solutions, we could add them all together, and that would be a new solution. What does that imply for our purposes? Well, of course, this solution it has freedom in the capital letters A, B, C, D, but the most interesting thing is this constant K, which actually changes the form of the function, changes the, the frequency of our sines and coses. That can be any constant we like. Um, once we've set one of these, then the other ones must use the same K, but we can, add, we, can, we can add together an entire solution like this to a second entire solution using a different value of K, and we can keep doing that for as many different K values as we like. So what we find is that the general solution has to be of the following form, or can be anything of the following form. So what I've done there is I've just copy-pasted the line above and put n subscripts all over the place. So now my a uh, symbol is, is in fact one of a family of constants a n, a0, a1, a2, and so it's my b, and so it's my capital C, and so it's my d, and moreover this k quantity is also um, a set of different k values. So for each particular k value, there must be a cos-like uh, or sine-like part, a sinusoidal part um, that varies with that k frequency multiplied by a time part that varies with the same k frequency multiplied by the constant c. Um, that pairing must always be respected, but I can add together as many such pairings as I like. And so this is very similar to the situation we were in with the diffusion equation, of course, except that there, instead of this sum of sines and coses in time, we had if you recall, an exponential that was something like minus k squared and then some constant uh, such as alpha for our diffusion and then uh, t. So instead of that, on this occasion, both the space-like and time-like parts are oscillatory, but it's still the same basic idea because what we can do, as we're about to see, is plug in time t is equal to zero and bam, we've got a boundary condition expression which uh, is essentially an invitation to use Fourier series to describe our time t equals zero arrangement. But let's let's step through that now. What I'd like to do is think about anything further we can say about these uh, constants a, b, c, d, given that what we're going to be interested in for the rest of the lecture is a vibrating string that is pinned like a guitar string at two points. What can we say? Well, the first thing that we can say is that when we set time t equals zero, or in fact any fixed time, it must be the case that at x equals zero, we have no displacement at all. And so that makes me come and focus on this term here and decide that I don't need it. Because what that will give me is a finite value for the display for the x is equal to zero. Um, but I am never going to need that. I'm always happy that my x is equal to zero point has zero displacement. A different way to say it is that I could imagine uh, mirroring my string, which I will just draw sort of with some dotted lines here, I could make it into an odd function and uh, mirror, it. well it's not really mirror so much as it is rotating it around in the usual way of an odd function. And so that would be extending my solution, uh, and of course we do that when we use Fourier series to describe a finite problem. Uh, a, a solution of that kind will always be fine. Uh, that's in fact the correct way uh, to extend this fixed function uh, into uh, the 
negative x direction and also into the uh, direction of great x is greater than y, we should extend it on by essentially um, considering what an odd function would look like um, at, uh, where the origin is at that point. The reason being that then there will never be any force, any net force in the up-down direction. If you zoom, if you imagine zooming, in fact, I can zoom in, can't I? <laughs> so uh, having zoomed in on the x-coordinate, if I have mirrored my function, I keep on saying mirrored, what I really mean is rotated 180 degrees. Um, so if I've, if I've enforced the principle that it's an odd function at, at that, around the origin, then, okay, I haven't drawn it perfectly, but if I had drawn it perfectly, you could see that the forces on the point at the origin would always perfectly balance out, which is just what we want, because we don't want the origin to move. And as long as uh, we were considering a, an extended solution that, by the way, happens to have the property that the origin never wants to move, then we're safe to stick a pin in it and say, well, I've pinned the origin. So we've, we've sort of constructed the scenario where the origin never wants to move by using the appropriate extension to our function. All right. And the same argument works out at x is equal to L. So what does that tell us about our constants? Well, it, it said we've, I've just argued that I want an odd function uh, in terms of the x-coordinate just by thinking about the x equals zero case. So that allowed me to immediately say that all my a n constants for this kind of solution, for this fixed string, should be zero, all of them. So that was easy. Got rid of one whole family of constants. Can I uh, keep going in the same spirit and get rid of some other stuff? Well, the next trick is actually to think about the uh, velocity of the string. So what I would like uh, is to um, limit myself to cases where the velocity of the string at time t equals zero is zero. So now I'm being very specific. I'm saying this is a plucked string at time t equals zero. So I am holding the string at time t equals zero and I release it. So it starts from zero velocity. If I'm willing to further constrain myself to those scenarios, then I can take a look at the time part and just think about uh, what that looks like. In fact, I can write it out. What does it look like in terms of a velocity? Oops. So if I put a little dot above the y to show that that's the derivative of y with respect to x, well, of course, that wouldn't affect the x part at all. Uh, although, by the way, we've already deleted all the causes. We've argued that they should uh, go away. But the cos terms here will become sines and have a minus sign in front. And the sine terms here will become causes. And we'll also, oops, not chalk, cos. And we'll also, by the way, have uh, picked up a factor of lowercase c in front. But that doesn't matter. All I all I actually am want to focus on is the fact that there's a family of sine-like and cos-like terms, but at time t equals zero, I want the velocity to be zero. Where that leaves me is uh, we've, we've argued we don't want the cos-like spatial terms because of the pinned at zero condition. We don't want these cos terms, but they actually came from sign terms in the original expression, of course. So in fact, what I should really do, instead of be applying my deletions here, I should go back to the expression above and say, up here, I don't want the causes and I don't want the signs because they become causes and uh, I only want the terms that become signs and give me a zero velocity at time t equals zero. So that simplified it a lot. As long as I'm only thinking about a plus string, then I, sh I reckon I should be able to do the job uh, just using a solution of the following form. That, I reckon, should do the trick. I've introduced a symbol e as the uh, the constant that uh, can... It's just a, a pure number, a scalar that uh, is just uh, telling me how much of each one of those pairings I want. And they do have to be pairings now. So the same kn must occur in these two things. But, of course, I can choose uh, to have as many different kns as I like. Okay, so there we've... Uh, written down uh, an expression that I'm claiming is going to give us all the generality we need to solve plucked, plucked string problems. And in fact, there's still one more thing we can do to simplify this expression or, or put a further restriction on it. Um, and that comes from our choice of these k constants. Do we need to consider absolutely every possible k? No, we actually only need to consider ones that are consistent with the periodicity of the function we're trying to build. And we're going to use our trick, as we've already said, of extending a non-periodic function to make it periodic. And let's zoom out, in fact, uh, at the risk of making this look really silly and small. Um, let me try and extend this function 
Okay, that's the best sketch I can do. It's not a great sketch, but what I hope I've managed to communicate is that um, in the region from x is equal to l to x is equal to 2l, I've just got the um, the same shape as between 0 and L, but rotated 180 degrees around. So um, this kind of mirror in inversion that I was talking about. And it's consistent with what I've drawn over in the X is negative region, by the way, because that would just match this region here of my overall repeating uh, function. And uh, just for the same as the argument at X is equal to 0, the reason I like this is if I zoom in at the X is equal to L point, I can see that the forces will forever and at all times be perfectly balanced. So there is no force that's trying to pull my string away from uh, its anchor point. And that's why this periodic solution um, that, that, that is for all values of x is going to align with uh, the scenario where we have um, just a finite function. That's why it's the correct continuation. But then the period of this thing is clearly 2 part, a 2L. The overall period is 2L, so we should be able to uh, use values of k, oh, let's go for a thicker pen again, that are, that are 2 pi over 2L times n. And we can cancel the twos, of course. So finally, that gives us the form that we need to use, we need to um, fit a Fourier series to. We will set time equal to zero. That will cause the cos terms to disappear for our boundary condition. And we essentially have the task of using a sine Fourier series to build any initial condition that we want for a pluck string. But we know already what we want um, because a pluck string is essentially where the string makes a straight line between anchor point one and anchor point two and where we have our plectrum or thumbnail or whatever plucking it. So let's draw that. Well, and oh, and uh, we've already argued quite carefully how we're going to extend this Fourier, uh, excuse me, extend this function, which is that uh, it, this, is, it, this, is, this is the up half and what will happen in the uh, x is equal to l to 2l is the, um, the down part of our triangular wave. So this is a triangular wave that's centered on the x-axis and has a frequency of, of uh, has a, a period of 2L. Now we can just write down what the Fourier series is for that because we've already worked with triangular waves before. I'll do that. Now this that I've just written down is the Fourier series we want. It may look a little bit different to the Fourier series we wrote down before for the triangular wave, but the reason for that is that last time we considered the triangular wave, uh, we made it centered on the origin so the peak of the triangular wave was centered on the origin. So in other words, it was an even function made out of causes. This is the shifted version that creates the same triangular wave, but now, uh, as we want it now, passing through zero at the origin. So that's why we have a slightly different form with this minus one to the power of n. That's a consequence of that change. You can get from one Fourier series to the other just by introducing a shifted x coordinate, for example. Now, what I've written down here, this is the, the more primitive Fourier series actually, it isn't quite matching our scenario yet because it has a period of 2 pi and it has a, uh, it goes, goes between plus 1 and minus 1. Whereas we want to go between plus a and minus a and we want to have a period of 2l, so now we need to just adjust that and that will be our solution at time t equals 0. There we are. Let's just make those adjustments. So that should be our time t equals zero solution. What then is our solution for all times? Well, we just have to go back to our rule here and see that for every sign uh, that's varying with some frequency k, subscript n, we must pair it with a cos that um, ha has the temporal frequency c times k, which that's the same k. So we just add that in now. There we are. As is often the case with these Fourier series type solutions, we end up with quite a, a big expression, uh, especially since here we, we didn't want to have a period of 2 pi. We wanted it to be realistic so that we could type in an L number. So we have those constants floating around here. But conceptually, it's a pretty easy thing once we're familiar with Fourier series. It's just our Fourier series that solves the boundary condition with the appropriate time-like factor inserted for each term. So to be very clear about it, this uh, quantity here is the same as this quantity here. And you can see the extra C factor, that speed of our wave um, is the is correcting between the spatial frequency and the temporal the temporal frequency, or I guess 
um, angular frequency. So there we are, that's our full solution. So here we are in Mathematica. I've set the amplitude equal to two, the uh, length of our, uh, the distance between the fixed points on our guitar string is equal to four. I set a value for the speed. And then as you can see here, I've defined our Y function exactly as we derived it just now. Um, I've also introduced a symbol KN just to keep things a little bit uh, um, not too crazy. And you can see that the, the key line is this one here, uh, which is exactly copied across. And I'm considering uh, 20 or is it 21 terms? So a pretty good but not infinite uh, number of terms in our Fourier series. And I'm already plotting out for us here what it looks like at time t is equal to zero um, over a range which is slightly bigger than the full range. So remembering that um, the way we extended our function, it actually has period 2L, even though we're only interested in the part from zero to L, this is exactly what we expect to see, right? It has a period of 2L, that's eight, and um, it has the right amplitude and it has the right um, uh, triangular wave form. So now let me tighten this up a bit. I'll, I'll zoom in to say, I don't know, negative 0.5 to uh, L plus 0.5, just so that that's the region we're really interested in, just going a little bit beyond the fixed points. And let's start running time forwards and see what happens. So let's run it forward a little bit. Uh, what do we get? Oh, that's easy, quite a large bit. All right, let's run it by, and it's quite a strange shape, right? So this is a moment after we've released our pluck string. And it seems like the prediction that we're getting from our equations is that we have actually a, a straight line, quite strange. As we've released it, we've got a flattened off triangular wave. What happens if we run on, so we were already looking at this one, but this is what we see later. So that flat um, uh, region just widens and the triangular wave just kind of sits there waiting for this flat uh, region to reach it. Uh, quite strange. And then if we go to uh, maybe a further uh, 1.5, okay, so let's uh, maybe go to 2 then, and uh, maybe 2.4. Uh, uh, it's, it's doing a mirror image of what it did before. It's starting to build that same triangular form, uh, but now in the negative uh, y direction. So if we go out to, I don't know, 4, 4 or something like that, we see it's, it's, it's nearly finished building that, and then we can guess what's going to happen. It's going to oscillate backwards and forwards. In fact, uh, Mathematica has a function that allows me to um, to 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 control time just with the slider. Let's use that. So here's exactly the same uh, thing again, but this time I've got a, a little slider that I can move, and I'll do that. And here we see, there we are. That's what Mathematica predicts. Let's do it again. So we should see this collapsing uh, ripple essentially, and then it builds itself up in the negative y direction. Now, and then it would come back again, of course, and uh, it will keep on doing that. Now that, it, do we believe that? Do we think that that's actually what would happen if, uh, let's not say a guitar string, actually a guitar string, I keep on saying guitar string, guitar string has a, a, a very, is not very stretchy. So if we wanted to see this, um, you know, in a real experiment, we would actually want to use something more like a piece of elastic because it's more stretchy. So we would be able to deflect it much further and, and, see, and you know, see something like what we see literally on the screen. Can we do that experiment? Well, I can't do it for you because I don't have the, the gear here, but fortunately I found a, a YouTube video and I should put the reference to it into this video because it, um, someone else has done the work for us and we can see whether what happens in the real world is a bit like this or have we really just made so many approximations and assumptions that what we've ended up here is an artificial solution. Okay, so here we are, the moment of truth. Has our maths been any good? Uh, here is, someone has done exactly the experiment for us. There's that stretch string. It's being held uh, by some kind of little release mechanism. And I can sweep, sweep forward in this video just like I was on the Mathematica, but what kind of shape will the wave have? Let's have a look. Look at that. Pretty much exactly what we predicted. And it even inverts down and starts to build the same thing. So we're seeing, seeing some slight curvature, but wow. Look how perfect that is. Okay, so I think with that uh, um, success story, I think it's a, a nice moment for me to sort of uh, wrap up the lecture. So there we are. That, uh, that I think is a really nice vindication 
of uh, the material, certainly in this lecture, but of the techniques we've used in general. Now, at the beginning of the course, I promised that uh, we would introduce some tools, Fourier series and Fourier transforms, that would allow us to describe real-world sit real situations that otherwise would be very, very tough. And indeed, even something like the triangular wave is, is not a very natural thing to describe mathematically unless you understand that it can be broken down into the natural sign and cause uh, entities. So there we are. It, it works. And uh, uh, let's leave it there. And I, I hope you've enjoyed the course. Thanks a lot.